Hello and welcome to this channel. My name is Jesper and in this video I'm going to be talking about congenital infections in a newborn. Also we will mention the acronym TORCH and each letter of it, what it stands for, and then we will go into more details about each of those diseases. A congenital infection in a newborn is an infectious disease which the fetus acquires within the uterus or while giving birth. It can either happen in the uterus transplacentally, meaning that the disease is spread via the placenta, or during the birth process, during the delivery, which we call peripartum. It is transmitted from the mother to the child. These disorders can be dangerous and have the potential to negatively affect the development of the fetus and have various long-term negative consequences. A term that you might have heard is the umbrella term TORCH, T-O-R-C-H. This is an acronym used to remember certain congenital infections that might frequently be spread in this way. T stands for the parasitic disease toxoplasmosis, O stands for others, R stands for rubella, C stands for cytomegalovirus, and H stands for herpes simplex virus. There are also other infections not under this acronym like HIV, the Zika virus and lymphocytic chorioameningitis. So the TORCH acronym does not cover all congenital infections and more infections might be discovered. Some of these infections can be prevented through proper immunization from the mother. Rubella is an example of this. It can be prevented by the mother having the vaccine before becoming pregnant. Rubella is normally not very dangerous for children of older age or for adults. It is usually self-limited in these patients. But when a developing fetus is infected with rubella, the infant can develop congenital rubella syndrome. And this can be devastating and lead to heart defects, to cataracts, deafness, or even it may cause an abortion. Now let's talk more detailed about each of these diseases that are for the respective letter in the TORCH acronym. We start with toxoplasmosis. This is a disease caused by the parasite Toxoplasma gondii. It can lead to congenital toxoplasmosis if the woman develops acute primary toxoplasmosis while being pregnant. Generally, if the mother contracted toxoplasmosis before the pregnancy, then the fetus would not get it. There might be exceptions. However, generally, when the mother has a built-up immunity, it will protect the fetus. However, if the mother contracts toxoplasmosis for the first time during pregnancy, then the parasite can spread across the placenta to the fetus and cause congenital toxoplasmosis. And this is what we're worried about. So the danger is for mothers who has never had toxoplasmosis, but then contracts it during pregnancy. It is possible to test antibody levels for acute and chronic infection with toxoplasma. And this is done by a simple blood test. The definite host of this parasite is all types of the cat family, ranging from house cats to lions. The cats infected can shed the parasite in its feces and then if a human comes into contact with this matter, that person can get toxoplasmosis. The symptoms for congenital toxoplasmosis is variable and ranges from mild to severe. However, there is a triad with symptoms that we should remember. The triad is as follows. Hydrocephalus, intracranial calcifications and chorioretinitis. Hydrocephalus refers to buildup of fluids within the brain. Intracranial calcifications refers to observable nodular areas of calcification seen on brain imaging, such as X-ray or CT scans. Usually they are randomly located around the brain's parenchyma. In the poster, there is a picture showcasing this. However, there the lesions appear black. However, in reality, on an X-ray or CT, they would be white. Chorioretinitis is a term that is referring to when there is inflammation within the posterior segment of the eye. It is a type of uveitis and the structures that are affected in a chorioretinitis is the choroid, its vessels and the retina. 
the treatment for toxoplasmosis in infants, so congenital toxoplasmosis, is etiological with the medications pyrimetamine and sulfadiazine. Also, we will treat the patient symptomatically depending on the progression of the disease. Next up, let's talk about rubella. Rubella is a disease which is also known as German measles. It is caused by the Ruby virus and in adults and in children it is usually self-limited and not very severe. The danger is that it can lead to developmental defects in fetuses, especially if infection occurs in the first trimester of pregnancy. The way it spreads is by droplet transmission. So from person to persons, humans are the only reservoir for this infection. The vaccine program contains rubella vaccine. Hence, it is important to take it to prevent complications for the fetus in pregnancy. When an adult becomes infected, at first it can lead to initial symptoms like a stuffy nose, swollen and tender regional lymph nodes, and then after a few weeks a rash may appear. The rash will start on the face, usually behind the ears, and then spread in a descending manner, so down to the neck and then the body. Infants with congenital rubella can actually be infectious to susceptible people or other children for a long time, months to maybe even years, since they shed a lot of viral particles in the bodily fluids for long periods of time. Diagnosis of rubella. It is possible to check for antibodies, so IgM antibody detection with the ELISA method. It is also possible to do a viral culture. Women who wish to become pregnant can test and confirm their immunity towards rubella by checking their IgG status. Okay, so now we went through the key features for congenital toxoplasmosis and rubella. Next up, let's talk about cytomegalovirus. In the United States, cytomegalovirus is the most common intrauterine infection. It is considered high risk to spread transplacentally, so over the placenta. The cytomegalovirus is a member of the herpesvirus family and it is spread via body fluids such as sweat, saliva, blood, breast milk, urine, etc. One of the ways many pregnant women get this infection is by being in contact with young children while being pregnant. This is because children under two years can shed the virus in the saliva for as much as two years on. It is also possible for a woman to transmit the virus to her baby even though she was infected with the virus long before pregnancy. This is because it is possible for the virus to reactivate. There is unfortunately no available vaccine currently to prevent congenital cytomegalovirus infection. The complications for the infant that can arise with this disease is developmental defects like sensory neural hearing loss, cognitive problems, vision loss, seizures and more. It is very individual how the baby will be affected. Next up we will talk about herpes simplex virus. In contrast to the other congenital diseases that we talked about so far, herpes simplex virus is more commonly spread during delivery, so the process of giving birth, rather than it being spread in the uterus. It is also possible that the fetus gets it earlier in the pregnancy in the uterus but this is more rare. There is actually an indication for gynecologists to do a cesarean section if the mother has genital herpes simplex virus lesions at the time of labor. This is to prevent the spread during delivery. Also here we have a triad of symptoms that we should remember for severe congenital infections of the HSV virus. This triad is mainly seen for congenital herpes simplex virus transmitted in the uterus, which was more rare than during delivery. The triad is as follows. Skin manifestations such as vesicles and scarring, damage to the eyes and central nervous system manifestations. Now, when we say skin manifestations, usually what we see is vesicles appearing on the skin and scarring. When we talk about damage to the eyes, we especially see chorioretinitis. Maybe you remember we talked about chorioretinitis for toxoplasmosis earlier in this video. Central nervous system manifestations can be many, and examples are microcephaly or hydrocephaly. This triad is not always seen, luckily. Okay, so now from the torch we mentioned T for toxoplasmosis, R for rubella, 
C for cytomegalovirus and H for herpes simplex virus, but we're missing the O. So we said the O is for others. So now lastly, we'll shortly mention some of the other congenital infections. So there are several, but the one I think is important to know is syphilis. Syphilis is caused by bacteria. The bacteria is called Treponema pallidum. And the mother can transmit the infection either if she acquired it before or during pregnancy. So both is possible. The mother can contract syphilis usually as a sexually transmitted infection to the baby. Then she can transmit it either transplacentally, so in the uterus, or during delivery, so when giving birth. For the infant, symptoms may not appear before weeks or months after delivery, sometimes not even for years. And the symptoms that manifest can be many, but frequently seen are fever, skin problems, reduced weight at birth, failure to thrive, meningitis, anemia, hepatosplenomegaly, so enlargement of the liver and spleen, eye infections, pneumonia, and cognitive deficits. In late congenital syphilis, there is something called Hodgkinson's triad. Hodgkinson's triad involves the eyes, the ears, and the teeth. For the eyes, what we can see is keratitis and blurred vision. For the ears, it refers to hearing loss. And for the teeth, they have notched incisors and mulberry molars. It can look a bit like fangs, very sharp and pointy. The disease is preventable for mothers who do not get the disease, or if they get the disease, properly treat it before getting pregnant. Penicillin is an effective antibiotic against the bacteria for both the mother and the infant. Now, also we mentioned that others are a term that can refer to pretty much any other disease, and examples can be varicella zoster, listeria, parvovirus, and Zika virus. We covered the most common and high yield infections for the torch infections. And if you liked this video and want to see more videos like this, feel free to subscribe to our channel. Also comment if there is any particular topic or disease that you would want us to make a video about. Thank you for watching and hope to see you in another video.